The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the church to take up its scriptural responsibility, to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible, and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, a theologian addresses the specter of anti-Semitism a visit to Independence Hall in Tel Aviv, a panel discussion on why Christians support Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure once again to welcome you to this minute, if we may call it that, uh, of discussion about the importance of Israel in this time. Welcome on behalf of the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. I would like to talk to you for a few moments about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, of course, is the hatred of the Jewish people. It's a very important subject for us to address at this time because it's growing all over the world. It's a phenomenon that has afflicted every generation and every decade from the centuries before our time. And therefore, we have to ask how come and why. In the Bible, we find out that anti-Semitism is a result of a peculiar call that God gave to the Jewish people. Historically, and in Europe, in the last 2,000 years, anti-Semitism has been manifested by not only the communities of Europe, but sadly, very sadly, by the church. The church that named the name of Jesus Christ felt that he could take the luxury of hating the Jewish people in complete contradiction of their own revelation and teaching. It is so sad that such a thing could ever creep into the church, and more than that, into one of the great reformers of the church called Martin Luther, if not the great reformer. His last letter that he wrote before he died was called Against Jews and Their Lies. So anti-Semitism is something that we experience today and sadly throughout the world. Today it is manifested not so much in the hatred of the individual Jew while it continues to persist, but now it is directed at the collective Jew and in particular the existence of the nation of Israel. And this hatred of the collective Jew finds its finds its modern day expression in movements like boycott, disinvest from Israel, and sanction Israel. This is an attempt of the enemies of Israel to discredit Israel, to delegitimize Israel, and finally to dismantle the Jewish state. This is nothing else other than naked anti-Semitism. And the real agenda at the bottom of movements like BDS and others is the destruction of the Jewish state. And one of the most potent arguments that is constantly flung against the nation of Israel is that she is an apartheid state. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I think that I have something of an authority to speak about it because I grew up in the apartheid state. I know exactly what it is. And also, God challenged me in those years to take it on all over the country. So I know something about it. Israel is not an apartheid state. It is a modern day liberal democracy that has chief justices as Palestinian or Arab, it has Arab members of the Knesset or Parliament. People can move and go anywhere. The uh, Miss Israel recently was in fact an Arab woman, a beautiful Arab woman. It is truly a multi-party democracy free from any discrimination or any type of hatred against any people. The conflict area here has nothing to do with apartheid. It has to do with an agenda within the Palestinian Authority and by groups like Hamas 
to destroy and dismantle the Jewish state. And it is therefore wrong to use the conflict with the Palestinians as an example of apartheid. It is nothing of the sort. It is a struggle between two peoples for survival. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, they have yet to change their charter, whereby their declared aim and purpose, according to their own charter, is the destruction of Israel. As far as Hamas is concerned, their charter is even worse. It calls for the destruction of Israel, but it also calls for the murder of every Jew in the world. And this is a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It has nothing to do with the apartheid state, but it is fueling anti-Semitism all over the world. And once again, as I've said, the target here is not so much the individual Jew, but the target of this wickedness and evil, and an attempt to liquidate the Jewish people is the collective Jew, the nation of Israel. It behoves each and every one of us to stand up against anti-Semitism and to resist it and to expose the roots upon which it is based. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 53 For you did call them out from among all the people of the earth to be your inheritance, as you spoke by the hand of Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. This is the place where the State of Israel was born on the 14th of May, 1948. Exactly from here, David Ben-Gurion, he will declare the State of Israel, and in this way, he will put an end to the exile of 2,000 years. The ceremony was held here in a Friday day at four o'clock in the afternoon. It was here in Tel Aviv, but not Jerusalem, because Jerusalem at the time was under heavy siege. The state was born in the middle of a terrible war, the War of Independence, which started, in fact, six months before the establishment of the state. The War of Independence started the day after that the UN approved the plan of the partition of Palestine. Here I have the map. And this is what they decided. It was a, a plan which was approved by 33 countries, which uh, voted in favor, 13 which voted against, and 10 countries which decided to abstain. But two thirds of the then members of the United Nations approved this plan. And in other words, they gave us, the Jews, the international, international permission to declare a state. This is a plan. It provides here the creation of the two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. According to the plan, Jerusalem will be international. And the last decision was that the British will evacuate their troops and leave Palestine on the 15th of May, 1948. The Jews accepted the plan with great joy. It was celebration and singing and dancing on the streets of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, of the major towns of uh, Eretz Israel. The Jews accepted the plan, the Arabs they did not, and next day started the War of Independence. It will last 15 months, 10 days. It will be the longest and the most difficult war in Jewish history. During the first six months, the war will be a local one between the Jews and the Arabs. But on the 15th of May, the British left. The same evening, five Arab armies, they are going to attack the newly born state of Israel. So in this very complicated situation, these guys here, you can see the members, the members of the provisional government, they had to decide whether to declare the state the day that the British are leaving, or to accept the, the American proposition of a ceasefire and a trusted, trusteeship regime of the UN. After discussions and debates, that evening, the 12th of May, 1948, three days before that the British left, 
The members of the provisional government, they took this dramatic decision to declare the state now that the British are leaving. The British were leaving on the 15th of May. It was Shabbat. And for many Jews, as you know, Shabbat is a sacred day. In order to not desecrate Shabbat, the ceremony will be advanced a few hours and it will be on the 14th of May at 4 o'clock in the Art Museum of Tel Aviv. Jerusalem is under heavy siege. And this is a museum of Tel Aviv in 1948. It was cho chosen this place not because this was the biggest room or the most luxurious one. It was chosen because this was the safest place in Tel Aviv. And you can see the windows, which are high and narrow. We are a little bit underground. There is an emergency exit. This small room is the most well-protected room in the town. So all the preparations were done like running against the clock. They had 36 hours to prepare everything. Chairs were borrowed from the near coffee shops and they built the podium and the table and they put here two flags of Israel, the portrait of Theodor Herzl, and in the second floor they invited the symphonic orchestra. At the end of the ceremony, they were going to play Hatikva. The ceremony started at four o'clock. It lasted, as I told you, 32 minutes. This is a, a copy, of course, of the parchment. The original one today is in the archives of the state in Jerusalem. But for many of us, this document is the most important document after the Bible. It says, we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel to be known as the state of Israel. And don't forget for a moment that we are only two years and a half or three years after the end of the Second World War, three years after the end of the Holocaust. We have thousands and thousands of displaced persons in refugee camps. And for these guys, for these people, this tiny piece of land it will be their home. And this is why David Ben-Gurion, he pointed out that this state, first and above all, it will be a Jewish state which will open its gates for all the Jews of the world. The following phrase, I think it's equally important because here it's mentioned very clearly that this state will be a state which will belong not only to the Jews, but it is the state which will respect the civil rights of all those who are citizens of this state. Because this state, it's written here, will be based on the moral principles of the prophets of Israel, which are three, freedom, justice, and peace. And there is one woman here, which is sitting here in this chair, her name is Golda Meir, a very strong woman. And I'm sure that you know that later she will become the first woman prime minister of Israel. She was sitting there and she started crying. And the same evening she wrote in her diary, I thought of the six millions. It was very late for them. I hope that it won't be late for the future generations. And then the orchestra from the second floor played the anthem, Hatikva. And with the playing of Hatikva ended the shortest ceremony in Jewish history. It lasted only 32 minutes. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 1 to 4. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people, thus says the Lord. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when I went to give Israel rest. The Lord has appeared to him from afar, saying, Indeed, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you will be built, O Virgin of Israel. You will again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in the dances of those who make merry. Hello, I'm Donna Holbrook, and today I want to talk to you about anti-Semitism. 
The European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights adopted a working definition of anti-Semitism as follows. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community, institutions, and religious facilities. In addition, such manifestations could also target the State of Israel, conceived as a Jewish state. Anti-Semitism frequently manifests itself by accusing Jews of conspiring to harm humanity. It is often used to blame Jews for why things go wrong. It employs sinister stereotypes. Sadly, the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights has just released a major poll showing an alarming rise in anti-Semitism. It isn't difficult to see how such tactics can harm a group of people collectively and the State of Israel. Anti-Semitism is manifested in the form of branding Israel as apartheid state. This is not the truth. Israel welcomes persecuted Christians from Sudan and other surrounding areas. Israel offers Arabs equality. Arabs are not only given voting rights, but they also hold positions in Knesset, that's Israel's government. Israel was attacked when it declared a state in 1948 by surrounding Arab nations and again in 1967. The PA Charter, Fatah, and Hamas Charters all call for the destruction of Israel, and Iran is an ever-present threat. Though Israel is hated by surrounding states, and though the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem worked with Hitler to try to annihilate the Jews, and though PA leader Mahmoud Abbas did his PhD in Holocaust denial, Israel is the one that is blamed for the strife in the Middle East and unjustifiably faces boycotts, divestments, and sanctions against it. Jesus prophesied in Luke 21, 24, that Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Let us to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and remember the words in Psalm 122. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. Scripture also teaches in Genesis 12:3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To the nation of Israel, God gave his revelation to mankind, his nature, his laws, and the history of creation. In Galatians 4:4, 4, 4, God sent to the Jewish people Jesus of Nazareth, who was the Messiah, or anointed one, the Christ. Up next, why do Christians support Israel? Welcome back to Inside Israel. I'm Christine Williams. We're discussing on our panel, why do Christians support Israel? Yes, the Bible says so. I'm starting with you on this one, Pastor <laughs> Tech. Sure. Why do you support Israel? Why do Christians support Israel? Mm. There are those watching that are wondering, why mm. do you support Israel? Some of them not Christians. Well, uh, you know, I support something that I love. Mm. And the Lord, God Himself, has said that, you know, Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And so, because of that, I love my God, and I love those my God loves. And that's the reason why I support Israel. See, it's not because, yeah, there, there are promises that He will bless us. But more than those promises would be, my, my support for them is driven by my love for my God. And because God loves them, I love them too. Mm -hmm. as, as simple as that. Eighteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well said. I remember when I first gave my heart to the Lord. Um, you know, before that, I, I didn't really have a concern for Israel. I didn't really. I wasn't necessarily anti-Israel, but I it just. I was kind of ambivalent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I remember I, uh, after I gave my heart to the Lord, I would just be in times of prayer and I'd be reading the Bible, and this this love for Israel began to fill my heart. That was supernatural. And you know, I remember when I was also in Israel, and I was honestly, I want to say this. And I hope I don't offend anybody. I was seeing a lot of kind of weirdness, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, in terms of like people almost idolizing Israel in the Christian community, like mm -hmm. almost to an extreme. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember talking to the Lord about it one day, and he, I felt like he said this, Faithine, look at it this way. Uh, you're married to Jesus, right? 
And I was mm. like, yeah, I've, I've given my heart to Jesus. And the Bible talks about it as a betrothment. And he said, well, well, Israel, are like they're like your in-laws, you know? And then in every good marriage, it's good to honor your mother-in-law. You know what I mean? So he said, don't you know, be weird about not it. Not everybody but, watching. <laughs> yeah. So he said, don't be weird about it. But there's there was something in my heart. I was like, oh, okay, I get this now. Like, to love Israel, it's to honor my husband, Jesus. It's mm -hmm. in a spiritual sense, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, and of course, we're talking in a spiritual sense here. That's we're right. not talking politically. Faithine, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but what you said there about, you know, some of the weirdness, I, I've heard that said as well. In mm. fact, I've even heard people from the Jewish community say, mm. yeah. what's with you people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's with this dancing and this carrying on mm. and this and this worship, this near worship of Israel? And have you have you worked that out? I mean, you gave part of it now, mm -hmm. part of the explanation now, but going into Israel now when you see it, mm -hmm. do you ha still have that same question sometimes of, some people may be taking it too far, or do you believe it cannot be taken too far? Well, let's be clear. Uh, Jesus loves everybody, you yes. know? Uh, just like for me, like yeah. I love my family. I love my mother. I love my sister. Yeah. I also love the grocery store clerk. I love those that aren't necessarily my family. So just because we love Israel doesn't mean that we don't love others. Um, and I do think that there's a way to do it that's balanced and, and functional. You know what I mean? Just like in, in yeah. real life. I'm not going to idolize my mother-in-law, but I'm also not going to dishonor her. I'm not going to not be there for her mm -hmm. when when she needs to be stuck up for. You know, I'm not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There's functional relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to translate that in, into this scenario. Well, Scripture says something very clearly that God is love. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yes. Jude. Um, I really uh, developed a passion for Israel through my relationship with Jesus. And, you know, the interesting mm -hmm. thing is, is that uh, uh, I hear from the Lord almost like a rhema word when I, I'm reading the word, and it's concerning Israel. And so since I became a Christian, uh, a believer in Yeshua, I have really sensed God's heart for Israel mm -hmm. and the Jewish sure. people. And it was almost an eye-opening experience when, uh, as a brand new baby Christian, I realized, oh yeah, Jesus is Jewish. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> some people still don't get that. It's a revelation. Yeah, it's a total revelation. <laughs> From the house and of David. So, you know, it's a natural thing. And, and honestly, Christine, some people believe that um, Christians have replaced Israel, and they haven't. Replacement theology. Yeah, is just and, a and you know, I just really think you, you, there's a balance there, but there's also that incredible feeling when you actually go to Israel mm -hmm. and you, you, you land like there. And it it's, like it's just yes. like, welcome home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you really just does. sense it in your heart, mm -hmm. and you just know that this is your place. And the Bible comes alive. And uh, yeah, y you know, I, I, I don't ever criticize people for what their personal beliefs are with regard to that. But I know for myself, like for me and my household, we will serve the Lord and Amen. we will support Israel and mm -hmm. the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big things in our time has been supporting Israel's right to defend itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the controversy on the international stage is like, okay, Israel kind of gets kicked or like bombs are being lobbed from outside of Israel and Israel kind of pushes back a little bit and then that's when it gets all yes. crazy internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think our role as believers as well needs yep. to say like, listen, this matters for democracy. This matters for international security. If it's not okay, for Israel to defend itself, is it okay for Canada? Totally. You know what I mean? Like, and so it's important that we take a stand on those issues. Faithine, you mentioned a very critical point because I know that scripture says to bless Israel, those who bless Israel will be blessed. Mm -hmm. But I also know that it becomes a topic of um, controversy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you're just, as you mentioned, you just love Israel because the Bible said so. I mean, within the Christian community, mm -hmm. we are told as Christians, Christian believers are supposed to read scripture and have mm -hmm. faith in the authenticity yeah. of the Word of God. This is what Christianity teaches. Yeah. But what you mention is also very important because it goes hand in hand with what Scripture talks about. Scripture and we regard God as a just God. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a democracy. You're looking at a country that represents human rights for all. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very important as well because mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. that there are those out there who may not be Christian and they're saying, look, we don't quite understand what's going on with Israel, mm -hmm. but we want to know why you love Israel. So I, yeah. I thank you for bringing up that point mm -hmm. as well. Would, would the two of you like to um, say any final words before we go for our break? Yeah, because uh, we're talking about supporting Israel here. But support is not just words. Mm. You, have yes. to, you have to act Action. it out. You, know, you have to show it. See, you got to go to Jerusalem, and you have to pray for them. 
Yes. So those are the things. I think uh, it's more than words. Mm -hmm. Supporting is more than words. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yes. Any final words there, Jude? I think supporting is more than words. Mm -hmm. it's, it's your commitment. Mm -hmm. um, it's your heart. And you show it through action, just exactly like what mm. you were saying. And mm. that is part of the reason why we um, have opportunities for Christians to pour into Israel through our aid projects mm. and through the yes. ICEJ Canada. The practicality. The practicality, yeah. absolutely. And we encourage people to engage yeah. because I think when God captures your heart for Israel, He draws you closer to His heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the best place to be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Julie, you're, you're closing these panels really good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, girl. <laughs> Great to meet Jude and Pastor Tech. I want to thank you very much for joining me. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. In consideration of Canada's 150th birthday, please consider 150 ways to bless Israel through your Christian embassy, the ICEJ Canada. Consider becoming a $150 monthly donor, plant 150 trees, 150 prayers for Israel. The opportunities are endless. Please contact us. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. Through your contribution to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk, Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield, Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder, Alias Support, Bet Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Megan David Adam Emergency Services, Canada Israel Young Adult Scholarship, Equip and Teach, Bet Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Gift Estate and Securities Funds.